Welcome to 15 Minute Fundamentals, where we break down crypto projects and learn about the drivers behind the data you see on our charts. Today, I'm joined by Lito from Hop Protocol, a roll-up to roll-up general token bridge. Hi, Lito. Welcome to 15 Minute Fundamentals. It's great to have you on. Hey there. Thanks for having me. Before we dive into the details, it would be great if you could just give a quick intro to Hop. So yeah, Hop is a multi-chain bridge connecting different scaling solutions to Ethereum to basically allow users to seamlessly transfer their assets between networks. Because as we know, Ethereum is scaling through layer two rollups, which bring much cheaper transactions to, to end users without meaningfully changing the trust assumptions of Ethereum. But they come at the cost of uh, fragmenting the user experience because now users have the assets on all of these different networks that aren't directly connected to one another. And Hub solves this problem by allowing users to yeah, just send their tokens between those networks in, in minutes. So let's say to, you know, from Optimism to Arbitrum, sending their ETH, or from Arbitrum directly to Ethereum mainnet in, in a couple of minutes. So in a way, we are abstracting away the fact that these rollups are different networks. It, we make it feel like one single thing. And, you know, this is already quite good today, but obviously we want to make this even better in the future. That's great. And, and to cover the basics in the beginning, I know a key actor in your system is called what you call a bonder. Could you explain what a bonder is and what the role is within the hop system? Yeah, the way that we achieve these instant or near instant transfers is by having some actor in this system providing this liquidity for the user at the destination chain upfront. So normally this data or transferring tokens between networks is not instant if you do it like the, the default way through the native optimism bridge or the native arbitrum bridge by virtue of how, how these rollups work. But we achieve this instant transfer experience by having this bonder, this market maker, providing the liquidity for the user upfront. So they take a risk. Uh, they say, you know, this transfer is legit. I'm going to you know, underwrite it and I'm going to provide the, the user the transfer sum upfront in exchange for a small fee. And then later they get reimbursed. And that is like happening through this sort of settlement system that we have built. But yeah, in a, in a nutshell, the, the bonder is a market maker, um, an actor in an important actor in the hub system. And can anyone permissionlessly join to become a market maker or do you have some sort of selection process for these bonders? Yeah, so right now with the current architecture of hub, we have one bonder per asset. So I think we have five assets at the moment. Um, so there will be like five bonders. And we have chosen these bonders carefully because first of all, they need to provide some non-negligible like amount of capital to do this job, right? You cannot just do it with like $100 or something. You need to have like a couple of millions. Secondly, you need to be sort of technical and run this this uh, server process to do it. And yeah, for that reason, the bonders that we have today are entities that are close to the Hub protocol. And in the next version of Hub, we're, we're looking to expand this role, make it permissionless and, you know, have anyone be able to join the, the network as a bonder. But from a user perspective, this bonder doesn't have any like privileged role. The, the bonder doesn't take custody of the user funds at any point in time. They're really just providing liquidity. And the, w the worst thing that they can do is essentially delay a transfer by deciding not to bond it for the user. In that case, the user would still get their funds at the destination chain, but just later. It's not like they're having like control of any user assets. They cannot do anything malicious. It's not introducing any centralization in, in the protocol, but the role is like permissioned, if that makes sense. Got it. And on financials, if I pull up your dashboard on Token Terminal, we can see that all fees paid on Hop currently go directly to supply side participants. Um, does the supply side include any other participants than these bonders? If you could open that up in a bit more detail and then follow up is what are your thoughts on a possible protocol fee switch in the future? So how are you thinking about capturing value from the activity on Hop right now? Yeah, you're exactly right. So right now, all the revenues, all the, all the fees paid by users go to the supply side. So that, those are two forms of liquidity. We call it uh, passive liquidity and active liquidity. And passive liquidity is basically LPs in curve-like AMMs that we have on each scaling solution. And these AMMs, LPs can provide 
so-called age tokens um, and and the canonical token like normal optimism USDC and paired with like hop USDC and and I'm not going to go into the details of like why this hop token exists and so on because that's not the purpose of this podcast but uh, basically they can stake this liquidity and then they receive a fee or like a fee for every transfer that happens through hop and then the second form of liquidity is this active liquidity and that's the bond that we discussed before and that we call it active liquidity because it's not as easy as providing liquidity in AMM which is passive here you actively you actually need to like do something so it's, it's active liquidity and uh, both of these actors take a fee on each bridge transfer and there's no other fee so yeah like you said 100 percent of uh, the fees go to the supply side and and we think that like right now that's how it should be because we, we want to grow the protocol as much as possible right like a volume is is the north star metric for us and you know it's it's similar to i guess uniswap or or, or even you know if you compare it to traditional world amazon like they just wanted to grow and grow and grow as much as possible and undercut all the competitors on fees because that's what matters to users and so we think about this in a in a similar way but that being said you know hop is a dao and it's not a meme at hop it's it's actually dao run like the the founding team doesn't have any voting power at the moment and any fees which could could be introduced at any point obviously it should make sense for for the community to accept it you know we have some ideas on what like a good value capture model could be and i i think uh, there'll be some discussions about this starting soon that, that sounds great and speaking about growing the protocol and its volumes what would you say are the biggest growth drivers or challenges on that front for hop right now I think like most of crypto, the biggest growth drivers or, or biggest challenges are always like market related, right? Like Hop does really well uh, when the market is hot and, and people are like being very active on the chain and transferring assets left and right because there's so much to do, so much arbitrage opportunities and so much speculation and, and so on. But then when the market cools down a little bit, then our volumes go, go down as well. So I think like most of the crypto space, we're hoping that there'll be, you know, more more use cases, better use cases, better applications, more users, and all of these things will drive more volume to Hop. As far as Hop directly is concerned, like I can't think of any particular challenge at the moment. <laughs> That's always a good, a good situation to be in. And a quick one on competitive landscape would be that fr from a user's perspective, what would be the one USP or core value prop of Hop that you want to emphasize to users? I think without a doubt that's security. So Hop has been built by three engineer founders who are also ex-auditors. They audited some of the very popular projects on Ethereum like DYDX, Open Zeppelin and so on. They then in 2018 started building a smart contract wallet called Ethereum, right? They were among, with Argent, they were the first smart contract wallet in its kind. And so it's a very complex piece of architecture uh, to, to, to build something like that. And I think they gained some very, very valuable experience and then pivoted to, to building Hop because they encountered this scalability issue firsthand, you know, by, by having this smart contract wallet and, and seeing users struggle with these high fees and so on. And so they pivoted away to, towards building Hop. They really built this with security in mind. And I think that we've had a very good track record when it comes to security, right? Like many, many bridges that took shortcuts have been hacked. Hop hasn't so far, touch, touch wood. And so as I mentioned before, like a user who bridges through Hop, uh, unlike with a multisig bridge, doesn't face any like custody risk. No one, no one can withheld, withhold their funds. And then for LPs, when they provide liquidity in, in one of these AMMs on, on any given network, they are not exposed to any of the risks of other networks because Hop, by virtue of how it's built, is, is isolating that risk per network. So you're not exposed to the weakest link uh, unlike, yeah, again, in other bridges where, you know, one, one network being exploited can translate to, you know, big accounting holes in the whole, in the whole overall multi-chain system. That's not the case for Hop. And so I think th these two things really make Hop stand out. You know, nothing is more important than security when it comes to bridges. We think the bridge that, that manages to be safe for forever, basically, will, will in the long run, like, outcompete all others, so to say. And then we think also that the user experience is quite good. Like, people have given very good feedback on how easy it is to transfer assets between networks. So 
that's probably also another USP. Yeah, we recently put out a piece on DeFi exploits with uh, 4.2 billion lost in exploits over the past two years. And of that, like 44% was due to bridge exploits. So that's a very important selling prop there. Um, maybe w one more on that topic in general. What is your stance on the cross-chain versus multi-chain discussion on do you think there's a time in the future where you'll be bridging assets between different L1s or is that off the table? So right now we're very focused on the Ethereum ecosystem because again our architecture is built with security in mind and we can offer this very high level of security for networks that are anchored to Ethereum in, in some way. And and this anchoring is is basically through some like native messenger bridge. That, that is what Hop needs to make Hop work on that network. We need a native message bridge. And so this is the minimum level of anchoring that, that we need. And then separate L1s are not possible to serve with, with this setup. And so we, we prefer to focus on L2s, uh, ZK rollups in the future. And we think this the L2 ecosystem is, is really just about to take off. And, and so there's still so much growth to capture there. And eventually... If it's profitable to expand to other layer ones and there's the right tech that has matured to service those layer ones in a trustless way, then I'm pretty sure that, you know, the, the community will also want to pursue that. Then I wanted to ask about your user composition and especially like how much of your activity is driven by retail users and how much is funneled in through specific partnerships with, for example, Coinbase Wallet uh, that you integrated with a while back. The vast majority is definitely retail. And we actually like this. We've seen some competitors, they have more a distribution among like, you know, a few whales that are do the bulk of their volume for us it's really quite evenly distributed we see a lot of users using hop and and most of them use hop directly through the hop user interface and then in some cases we we also see market makers you can see that those are larger wallets that that move assets around because they have some market making activities on on these different chains and need to rebalance their, their portfolios we also see arbitrageurs we have these AMMs, um, as, as I explained earlier. And so sometimes it can happen that these hop tokens are not mispriced, I would say, but are just like off peg from their canonical counterparts. So hop USDC would trade at a premium to, to canonical optimism USDC, for example. And then you have these actors that step in to bring them back to peg because it's basically risk-free and easy to do. So there's also one user group, I would say. And then, yeah, you mentioned Coinbase Wallet. So there's also, I think at the moment, like three to 5% of, of the hub volume that comes through third-party UIs. So that's bridge aggregators like LeFi and, and Bungie. And then you have like Instadab, you have Polymarket, you have Lyra Finance and Coinbase Wallet apps that have chosen to directly integrate the hop bridge into their UI to make it more seamless for users to interact with the application. And, and we think that's going to be growing a lot because it's just part of a good user onboarding flow, right? People or apps also integrate the fiat on RAM to make the onboarding easier. So I think the next logical step is to have the bridge integrated. So yeah. Got it. Uh, you launched the Hop token in early June this year in a fashion that at least I saw lots of good feedback on crypto Twitter on the way you did it. So could you walk us through how you approached structuring the airdrop to ensure healthy distribution of tokens and removing the addresses of Sybil attackers? Yeah, so I mean, it's super hard to do an airdrop easily these, these days because just everything is being gamed, right? The, the the way Uniswap did their airdrop where they just gave like, I, I think it was 400 uni tokens to every address that had like done a swap on Uniswap, that, that just doesn't work anymore, right? Because that in incentivizes people to split their activities across many different wallets that they have. Like instead of doing 10 trades on one wallet, uh, they will do one trade on 10 wallets. So that is the complexity here that it's very hard to reward like a very large number of people by making the eligibility requirement very low because the lower you you make it the easier it becomes to game so the easy way for hop would have been to just give hop tokens to liquidity providers right like people who staked liquidity in in one of these amms because and then just say like you know per dollar of liquidity that you provide that you receive x amount of, of hop tokens because that's impossible to game but obviously that is not the kind of distribution that you aim for because you want to have a very large and decentralized community. So we really put a lot of work into singling out users that were 
you know, legitimate like bridge users. So we, we didn't want to, the airdrop to only go to, to LPs, but also to bridge users. And we put up some requirements, like I think it was minimum two transactions and at least $1,000 in, in volume. So $500 across two transactions would have uh, made you eligible. And that gave us like a number of addresses. And then f once we had that list of addresses, we looked at those addresses with more scrutiny and removed some of these addresses based on their behavior. When I say we, I, d I don't mean us as a team. We actually made this in, in co a completely transparent and we could say open source uh, process where anyone could become a civil hunter and submit their findings to a repo on, on GitHub and they would also receive a reward for, for finding some, some of these civil attackers. And uh, yeah, that was incredibly successful. We had some great people chime in there and uh, there was so much value that was saved from going to civil attackers like that, that instead went to legitimate users. So, so basically, the more people would be hunted down, the bigger the airdrop for legitimate users. So there was also an incentive there to, to find them and for the community to, to chime in and help. Yeah, and that, that was super cool. We got great contributions. And, and now we've seen, I think, two or three other projects, uh, most recently Gnosis Safe, adopting the same strategy. So that was, that was cool to see that we sort of set a new standard there. Yeah, that, that was 100% well executed, and especially the incentive alignment. Now, final question here is, um, what's next for Hop? So what can you just expect from your mid to long term roadmap? So I cannot disclose everything because there's like things that the founders have, you know, up their sleeves, and they will present it to the community when it's when it's right to present. But um, the things that are, you know, public and anyone can like see in the governance forum is one, I think still this week, we're going to deploy an incentive reward system for people who bridge into optimism because the, the hop DAO received 1 million op tokens from just the, the original optimism airdrop. So that's like close to $1 million in value, right? And, and we're going to use this to make bridging into optimism cheaper. So every time someone bridges into optimism from any L2 or from Ethereum, they receive 80% of their fees uh, back in op tokens. So I think that's going to yeah translate into higher volumes. Yeah, then we have different other proposals that are sort of you know past snapshot and are now like about to be submitted to the DAO for like final voting and an SNX bridge for example so so new assets there's also yeah different discussions around adding new networks and also a liquidity mining reward scheme where uh, so with hop tokens where people who provide liquidity in those AMMs receive hop tokens so yeah that would give deeper liquidity and and uh, make transferring assets cheaper because deeper liquidity means you know less slippage and uh, better prices for bridges lots of cool stuff coming up looking forward to see that play out thank you so much Lido for this great overview of hop and let's do this again in in a few months it's good having you on yeah i would love to i'm sure i'll have a lot more to talk about <laughs> <laughs>